first at 9. This is Other Than I, 24-7. In your headlines tonight, Deputy Foreign Minister requests Putland President to stop firing at Ares 13. Sri Lankan crew on board a hijacked vessel tell other Derana that security forces should withdraw. Mangala says no provisions in constitution for foreign judges. Incumbent PM wins third term in Dutch elections. And Chandimal completes a rescuing innings for Sri Lanka. Well, hello there. Very good evening to you. Thank you for joining us here at Adha Dirana 24-7. I'm Dasaman Prematunga and let's take a look at your local news first. Now, the Sri Lankan crew on board the hijacked Ares 13 requests Sri Lankan the government's assistance to convey to the Somali government to withdraw their security forces from the immediate area of the vessel. Now, when other Derana contacted captain of the hijacked vessel, A. Nicholas, he mentioned that the pirates will not negotiate a ransom for their release until the security forces' mission eases. Other Derana was also able to speak with Ruan Sampat, the chief officer of the vessel. He said that although firing is temporarily halted, if any firing takes place again, the lives of the crew could be in danger as the vessel is an oil freighter. Now, the Putland Maritime Police Force launched rescue mission of the Aris 13, which is held at anchor off the northern coast of Putland. And we'll bring you the latest on that story uh, very soon, but we move on with local news. Now, President Maitripala Sirisena calls for the full and proper utilization of lands of the country in the production process. The President said this speaking at the Ram Bimaka Urumea ceremony held in Hambantata today. The Ran Bimaka Urumea ceremony to present deeds and grant documents by ensuring the land rights of the people in Hambantota district was held in Hambantota under the patronage of President Maitripala Sirisena today. The President presented title deeds to several beneficiaries representing Ambalantota, Angunakola Palasa, Thangalla, Valasmulla, Virakatiya, Katuana, and Mahavali area. As an agriculture-based country, it is necessary to use the few lands we have for the production process of the nation. More than 25% of the population is facing poverty. Therefore, we could reduce the poverty level by making the best use of our lands. Also, it is said that three ministerial positions related to fisheries are held from this district. The cabinet ministerial position, the deputy ministerial position and local government minister position are all held by individuals from the Hampantara district. I think this situation should be changed. Therefore, I expect to vest more power to Minister Mahinda Amarawira so that he could develop the Hambantara district productively and in turn the country. Meanwhile, President Maitripala Sirisena declared open the newly built Ambalantota Cultural Centre constructed by the Ministry of Internal Affairs, Wyambar Development and Cultural Affairs. And the United States said it is pleased that Sri Lanka agreed to co-sponsor the draft UNHRC resolution and welcomed Colombo's efforts to seek reconciliation. Now, acting U.S. State Department spokesperson Mark C. Toner said that on Monday, the United States and other members of the Friends of Sri Lanka core group tabled a draft resolution at the UN Human Rights Council on promoting reconciliation, accountability and human rights in Sri Lanka. The statement further revealed that the United States had closely worked with UK, Montenegro and Macedonia and in partnership with the Sri Lankan government to draft the resolution. It also says that the United States is looking forward to the adoption of the text. Foreign Minister Mangala Samarawira says the provisions of the present constitution does not allow foreign judges into the country. As responding to questions by journalists, the Foreign Minister said that the government is in the process of creating a judicial system to win the trust of all. 
At the time we introduced our roadmap to them, although they approved our proposal, they too requested to add a few of their own propositions. That is acceptable. It was according to this that we included their proposal into our agenda. These are only proposals. This is not an international problem. This is also not a problem of introducing foreign judges. We proposed a program that would win the trust of the people. Our proposal does not state that foreigners will be included. That is one recommendation foreign judges cannot be accommodated in this country according to the present constitution. If we are to include foreign judges, we will have to bring in new constitutional reforms. <laughs> And more, oh, it's, it's an update on the Somali pirate ship story. Now we have the captain of the hijacked vessel, A. Nicholas, who is speaking to us. The Somali Navy has surrounded the ship at the moment, and the pirates are with us inside the ship. They have given a few hours for the Navy to leave the area. What the pirates are expecting is for the Navy to leave, and then they will negotiate with the company regarding the ransom money. Please make them leave. Aris 13, a bunker tanker used for transportation of fuel oil and gasoline, was docked in Colombo as it prepared for a voyage that would take it first to Djibouti and then on to Mogadishu. Sri Lanka Navy confirmed that the vessel had been docked in the Colombo Harbour until the 27th of January and was listed with the Lloyds Register under a Sri Lankan flag. However, the ship had departed on the 28th of January for Djibouti, at which point it had changed its flag to that of the Comoros Islands. Having called safely at Djibouti, Aris 13 embarked upon its journey to Mogadishu only to be boarded by armed pirates near the Horn of Africa. According to both Sri Lanka Navy and piracy expert John Steed, the ship had been travelling close to the Somali coast at a very slow speed and had no protective measures to combat the potential threat of piracy. Ships often have water hoses and barbed wire on their decks and sometimes armed guards for protection. Today, Foreign Minister Mangala Samarwira addressed the issue of the hijacked vessel at a media briefing. <laughs> We have spoken to Aurora Shipping Company in Dubai and to its Colombo agent, ABC Phoenix. The companies have spoken to the master of the ship and he has clearly stated that the sailors are unharmed. Uh, we have alerted all the necessary uh, centers and we are keeping a close watch and these hostages are safe and in, and in good. My ambassador in uh, Ethiopia has been working very closely with the Somalian government. A separate briefing was also held regarding the hijack. The Foreign Ministry, the Ports and Maritime Affairs Ministry, the Navy and the AJ Shipping Company are working to help save the sailors. There is a report of a ransom demand but the report has not been confirmed to us. We are trying our best to save all eight. If an official ransom demand is made, the owners will comply. The owners always put the crew first. Moving on with more local news now, two persons have been sentenced to a 19-year imprisonment for setting fire and damaging the medical center and the office of former district campaign manager of the United National Party of Anuradhapura, Dr. Raja John Pulle. Former Provincial Council members of the United People's Freedom Alliance in Mihintale, Anil Pushmananda and Garmini Jayasurya were arrested in this connection. Dr. John Pulley's house and office were set on fire by damaging the property during the North Central Province election period in 2008. The trial was conducted for eight years and indictments were filed for six accused over the case. One of the suspects died and the judgment for the remaining five were passed today. Anuradhapura Magistrate Manjula Tilakaratna passed a 19-year imprisonment for the first and fourth defendants, former UPFA Provincial Council members Anil Pushpananda and Garmini Jayasri. The other three suspects were acquitted and released. The complainant, Raja John Pule, died in the bomb attack which targeted Major General Janaka Pereira during 2008. <laughs> Respecting the court, we accept the judgment, but we hope to file an indictment and we are going to the Court of Appeal.
We have another update on the Somali hijacking um, story uh, tonight. Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs Dr. Harsha De Silva says that he spoke to the Chief of Staff of Putland and the President has agreed to stop firing at Aris 13 and allow negotiations. We have already started doing all that is necessary in a diplomatic level. We have discussed with the Somali government and the owners of the ship. Minister Mangala Samarivira and myself have personally discussed the matter with the relevant parties. We even spoke with the Sri Lankan in the ship. I spoke with the Chief of Staff of Puntland and asked them to withdraw their ships from the area. Moving on with business news, now Assistant Governor of the Central Bank, Echi Karna Ratna, says that 14 internal transfers were made within the Central Bank a few days before the controversial Central Bank bond auction in 2015. Now, appearing before the Presidential Commission of Inquiry investigating Central Bank bond issuances today, the Assistant Governor said it was a rather unusual occurrence. The Presidential Commission of Inquiry investigating the Central Bank bond issuances commenced its usual proceedings at 10 o'clock this morning. Assistant Governor of Central Bank H. A. Karuna Ratna appeared before the Commission in his capacity as Secretary of the Monetary Board. The internal appointments and transfers just after Arjuna Mahindran took office as Governor of the Central Bank came under much scrutiny. Senior State Counsel Shahida Barry inquired of the Secretary of the Monetary Board as to how many internal transfers were called after Arjuna Mahindran's appointment as CBSL Governor. H. A. Karnaratna responded that 14 of the 25 heads of department were transferred to other departments on the 9th of February 2015. He also revealed that this was the highest number of high-level internal transfers made within the central bank on a single day. The transferred 14 heads of department had been overlooking key operational departments within the central bank. When inquired whether this is a normal procedure, Karna Ratna said he had worked under eight governors, but that was the first instance such a high number of internal transfers took place. The commission then inquired whether such transfers were reported during the tenure of former Governor Ajit Nivad Cabral or incumbent Governor Indrajit Kumaraswamy. The Monetary Board Secretary went on to say that he had not seen many internal transfers during their tenures. He added that during Arjuna Mahindran's tenure, 500 staff members were transferred to other departments. When inquired of his opinion on such transfers, Karna Ratna replied that the internal transfers were unfavorable for the central bank proceedings and that former superintendent of the public debt department N.K. Seneviratna's appointment was questionable as she did not have the required qualifications to hold the position. He added that senior staff members within the central bank were concerned. Karna Ratna added that he, along with a few other senior officers, personally approached the former governor to discuss the matter. They had requested the former governor to consult at least the senior management before any internal transfers were made, to which Arjuna Mahindran had agreed. The secretary of the monetary board then said that their efforts were futile when the former governor called another 34 transfers in 2015 and almost 10 transfers in 2016. The Commission of Inquiry will continue sittings on Monday. The Colombo Equities extended their losing streak for the eighth straight session despite foreign outflows. And with all the details, here is RM Sivanandan with more from the trading flow. The benchmark oil share price index lost 3.59 points to close at 6,028.57. While the S&P Sri Lanka 20 index lost 2.88 points to close at 3,447.19. The turnover was 272.13 million rupees with 18.63 million shares changing hands in 2748 trades. Top 5 gainers of the day were Adam Investments, Muscle Plantations, Blue Diamonds, Tesegro and Lankem Developments. Today's foreign purchases was 151.3 million rupees and the foreign sales was 47.87 million rupees. And now here's a look at how the Sri Lankan rupee traded against other currencies during the day.
Well, meanwhile, gold prices have spiked after the U.S. Federal Reserve raised interest rates for the third time since the 2008 financial crisis. Gold futures on the COMEX division of the New York Mercantile Exchange rose to $1,224.90, up $24 or 2% from its previous close, following the Fed's 25 basis point rate hike. Meanwhile, China's central bank has followed the U.S. Fed in tightening policy, increasing the rates it charges in open market operations and on its medium-term lending facility. Starting off with tennis news, Roger Federer put on a stunning display of aggression last night to defeat fifth seed Rafael Nadal in the fourth round at the Indian Wells. The four-time champion's win sets up a quarter-final showdown with Nick Kyrgios, who ousted Novak Djokovic for a second time inside a fortnight. <laughs> Roger Federer displayed an improved backhand to beat Rafa Nadal 6-2, 6-3 in what was the 36th meeting between the pair. Federer, who got the better of his Spanish friend and rival in the Australian Open final in January, broke Nadal's serve to open the match and survived a breakpoint to take the second game. The Swiss then took a 4-1 lead before sealing the set and continued to press in the second, keeping Nadal on his heels. Federer will now face Nick Kyrgios, who upset the defending champion at Indian Wells, Novak Djokovic, in straight sets. 15 seeded Nick Kyrgios stunned Djokovic 6-4, 7-6, recording 14 aces and not facing a single break point. The Australian is now 2-2 two for two in his matches with Djokovic after knocking the former world number one out of Acapulco two weeks ago. Moving on to some cricket news now. Having started the second day of the second test against Bangladesh at 238 for seven, Dinesh Chandimal continued to lead the Sri Lankan lower order in a fight back that culminated in an innings of 338 all out. Beginning the day on 86 with Ranganaherath on 18, Chandimal was able to continue a responsible knock, setting up 50-run partnerships with first Herath and then Suranga Lakmal. That is it. That is an eight. Is an eight test hundred, fourth versus Bangladesh indeed. Displaying a controlled innings, Chandimal scored his eighth test century and his fourth against Bangladesh in six matches. Chandimal eventually fell for 138, but handy partnerships for the 8th, 9th and 10th wickets lifted Sri Lanka to 338. Birdman takes it and Bangladesh have finally broken through. At the end of the day, Bangladesh managed 214 for the loss of 5 wickets, with Sandakan picking up 3 scalps. Oh, that's in the air and that's out. Is that out? It is. What? Former Indian Cricket Board Chief Shashank Manoha resigned from the post of Chairman of the International Cricket Council yesterday. Manoha held the office for only eight months and cited personal reasons for his resignation. Manoha was elected unopposed on a two-year term as the ICC's first independent chairman in May last year and had pushed for reforms that would curtail the influence India, England and Australia wield over the game's finances and administration. Earlier this month, the ICC agreed in principle on a governance structure that included a new revenue distribution model which seeks to address the current imbalance favouring the big three. A final decision on the new structure will be taken when the ICC meets in April, though the impact of Manoha's absence is yet unclear. In his letter to ICC Chief Executive David Richardson, Manoha cited personal reasons for his resignation. <laughs> Well,
Welcome back. Taking, taking a look at your international news now. U.S. President Donald Trump's revised travel ban on refugees and visitors from six mainly Muslim nations met with yet another legal blow as a U.S. federal judge in Hawaii issued an emergency halt to the executive order just before it was due to come into effect today. President Trump reacted by describing the ruling as an example of judicial overreach. U.S. District Judge Derek Watson ordered the halting of the ban, saying that evidence backing the government's argument that the ban was a matter of national security was questionable. In his ruling, he also argued that the changes made between the first and second versions of the travel ban were not sufficient. The ban, had it taken effect, would have barred the entry of visitors from Iran, Libya, Somalia, Sudan, Syria and Yemen for 90 days and refugees for 120 days effective today. While Trump insists that the ban would stop terrorists from entering the country, critics say that it still discriminates against Muslims. No Speaking at a rally in Tennessee, Trump responded to the ruling vowing to fight even as far as Supreme Court level. This is an unprecedented judicial overreach. This ruling makes us look weak. We're going to fight this terrible ruling. We're going to take our case as far as it needs to go, including all the way up to the Supreme Court. Far-right populism suffered defeat in the Netherlands as incumbent Prime Minister Mark Rutte's party won the country's general elections, leaving firebrand politician Goethe Felder's party in a distant second place. Mainstream political parties across Europe were relieved at the outcome of the Dutch vote, which has widely been seen as a test of support for nationalist and populist parties in the continent. Premier Mark Rutte's ruling VVD party won 33 seats, while Filder's Freedom Party won 20 out of 150 seats. Rutte, celebrating victory while poised to begin a third term in office, said that the Netherlands had indeed said no to the wrong kind of populism. Filders, who controversially pledged to withdraw the Netherlands from the European Union, close all mosques and ban the Quran, responded by saying he would offer tough opposition and that a patriotic spring would happen. The VVD must now form a coalition government with other parties, but the possibility of the Freedom Party being one of them has been ruled out. Continuing his month-long tour of Asia, King Salman of Saudi Arabia met with Chinese President Xi Jinping today. The Saudi King's tour is aimed at building ties with the world's fastest growing importers of Saudi oil and promoting investment opportunities. Having been treated to the red carpet in Beijing, the Saudi king inspected the Guard of Honor with Chinese President Xi Jinping before sitting down for talks at the Great Hall of the People. Among the items expected to be discussed is the sale of a stake in giant state firm Saudi Aramco. Sources suggest that China Investment Corporation and China National Petroleum Corporation may invest in the planned flotation. Hong Kong is among markets including London, Singapore, Tokyo and New York that have been identified as possible venues for the 5% sale of the company, which is valued between $400 billion and $2 trillion. Welcome back. Taking a look at your weather forecast. Now, showers or thunder showers will occur at several places over the western, Sabaragamu and central provinces and in the Gold District after 2 p.m. tomorrow. Showers or thunder showers will also develop at a few places elsewhere after 2 p.m. Rainy conditions may occur in the northeastern coastal areas of the island in the morning as well. Time now to take a look at the city by city weather forecast.
Well, that's it on your main news tonight. Now, for the latest in local, international, business, sports, weather or entertainment news, log on to www.adhaderana.lk or like us on Facebook or follow us on Twitter at Adhaderana. But before we go, we want to leave you with some rare visuals from Sri Lanka at the end of the Second World War. Do enjoy. Thank you for watching. Good night. a day. This is Sri Lanka's premier news channel, Adhaverana 24-7.